So today we're going to talk about seven ways to raise more money with storytelling. Okay, and this is specifically geared towards improving your messages so that you can raise more money. Uh, and these are tactics, uh, tactics and strategies. So let me just go full screen here. The first thing is that storytelling isn't just for bedtime. All right, and I often hear when I speak with nonprofits, I I hear this idea that you know storytelling, they're really not sure what role it has in an organization, and also there's this idea that it's a nice to have and not a need to have. Well, the fact is, uh, storytelling herds elephants. Okay, now there's a book called Switch, and basically it talks about why people uh, take action. What makes people change? What, make pe what makes people switch? And what they talk about is really uh, something that brain scientists have known for a little while, uh, but has existed for, uh, I want to say, 200 million years. And so this is what's called the limbic system. Uh, and it's basically the center of the brain. And <clears throat> this is what is the emotional part of our brain. Okay, the language of this limbic system is the language of stories, images, archetypes, uh, metaphors, pictures, video. That is the language of the limbic system. The analogy that they use in the book, they talk about a little person riding this elephant. The little person, you could say, is the, the frontal lobe, our frontal lobe oh, we think that we should be doing this because this makes sense. And, oh, if I was that person, I would definitely do this because of X, Y, and Z reason. Okay. The fact is people don't really behave that way. Okay. They might look at their past behavior and kind of, you know, think about it with this frontal lobe. But the actions that we take are primarily driven by emotions and needs, avoiding pain. So this is really, really hard to change. Habits are hard to change. So they talk about this as an elephant. You know, how do we move the elephant, which is the limbic system, when all we have is really, you know, uh, a, a jockey, a little jockey kind of riding on top of this elephant, okay? And the key is through storytelling and through uh, images, all right? And the reason why is because storytelling has existed since mankind has existed, and we are all moved by stories. We get that. Um, but stories are not just for entertainment. They are for many things, including fundraising. Now we're going to get into some tips. So this is, this is a picture of me with Gideon and his sister Leia, and they are from Tanzania. They worked with an organization called Epic Change that helps fund a school, a Shepherd Elementary School in Tanzania, and then they came to America. And I got to meet them. And what Gideon told me, now this is about four or five years ago, he said, I want to be an astronaut. Okay, so this is really, really where he's coming from. That's that's the that's the guy on my right. Okay. And so really he does want to become an astronaut. In fact, he's signed up and enrolled into flight school in Florida. So now he lives in Florida with Stacy Monk and Sanjay, who founded Epic Change. And uh, basically, he's you know attending flight school, and he needs a little bit more money. So what he did was he created a Kickstarter campaign. Okay. Now what's great is that we're following a real person. This is somebody that we can really actually get behind. Okay. That's why the first tip is to make your story about a real person, and not only that, make it about one person. Right. There's a lot of research that says that if you talk about 100,000 hungry kids in Africa, nobody's really going to donate. Nobody's going to be behind that, okay? But if you talk about the one girl who is unable to live a happy life because she's hungry, then you're really going to get at something. And the reason why is because that story really, really resonates with the, uh, with the emotion, right? It's much more immediate, much more emotional, okay? Number two, make it bold. So if you're going to tell stories about your people, don't have pity. Don't say, these poor people, we really need to help them. Pity is not going to work. Make it bold. People want to be part of something huge and bigger than them, and people want to be strong. People want to live bold lives. They want to be part of things that are bold. So when you write a story, make it bold, make it stand out, and, and make it huge. You know, make it, I guess you could say, epic. You're making a story. And this is going to be critical to help you 
and your fundraising message. Use adjectives and verbs. And what the verbs do is basically propel the story forward. And there's generally speaking in a story, there's going to be a past, present, and future. Okay, and I'm going to get to that in a second. But this one covers a lot of these bases using adjectives and verbs, moving the story forward and creating images in your mind and, and kind of using words that are going to bring out specific emotions, which is I've got to get behind this guy. You know, I really want to be part of this. I have a connection to this kid. Okay. Beginning, middle, end, and end. So this is what you could call a classic story arc. Star Wars, uh, Wizard of Oz, you name it. Every single story has a beginning, an opening scene where you kind of get to know the characters. You, uh, and that part is really critical because that establishes a relationship. Even though the character is fictitious, right? So Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, we know that she's obviously not a real person, but we get pulled into it because of her story. We get that set up with her family. Where are her parents? You know, she's living with her aunt and uncle. What's that about? So we're, we're pulled into the story right from the get-go, okay? Because we've gotten the details about this person. Then uh, someone has an obstacle, right? There's a tornado comes along, throws Dorothy into the middle of the woods, and she has opt optical crisis after crisis after crisis until she has this, uh, or the story, I should say, has this, this climax, it says right here, where, you know, it's revealed that um, really everything that they're looking for, courage and hope, and the heart and the brain really exist in their lives. That's what they discover. That's kind of the ultimate resolution of that story, right? Uh, so going back to Kimmy here, we have a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? So this was the situation before, you know, before Kimmy, we knew Kimmy, you know, this is what her dream was, and she was really struggling, but, but, but she had a serious problem. She had a serious problem, and then we started working with her, or then she was able to get a new home, and because of a new home, that she's able to build this foundation, okay? Or because of this treatment, she's able to enjoy time with her friends, or play music, or play the piano, whatever her, whatever the dreams are, right? Um, so here's another way to look at it, right? So basically format, a format for your stories. Introduce the hero, okay? Here's the hero. Uh, hero, and introduce the hero such that you're establishing trust. So describe name, age, where do they live, what are their hobbies, um, what do they look like? You know, describe the person, show a picture. That's the quickest way to do it. So you set that up and you establish this trust relationship connection with the potential donor, whoever's, or whoever's reading the story or watching the story, if it's a video or being exposed to the story over time. Now our, our hero has an obstacle. Whoa. Okay. And the obstacle is, um, very real. Okay, that's why it's important to use a real person, real stories, so that uh, people can relate and they can trust the story a lot more and they can trust your organization. Okay, um, but the end, the third part, so beginning, middle, and end, the end is always like, hey, this is going to be different now. Okay, this is how we're going to end the story together. You can join us. Okay, uh, number five, this is a tough one for people. Talk about the money talk about the money. And the reason why I say this is because people will ask, even unconsciously, they will ask, why do you need money? Right? So when I listen to NPR, public radio, or uh, yeah, WBUR actually in Boston, um, <clears throat> you know, they do fundraisers. Okay. They're really straight. I love their fundraisers because they're very straightforward about it. They say, hey, we have a budget and um, you know, we have enough to cover 90% of our costs and we need to, you know, meet this specific goal. Now during our fundraiser, we need to hit $500,000 by the end of whatever it is in order to meet our goal so that we can get program that you need, right? That's basically their pitch, but they always introduce the pitch, kind of the money aspect of it to just to say, Hey, you know, we have costs that are paying for a lot of things, but in order to achieve this specific result or in order to have this specific show or if you're building a school, the library in the school, in order to have that, we need X amount of money. They call this a funding gap, okay? Uh, and so people are going to ask, why do you need money? What's the story? Do you actually have money? Are you a legit, 
legitimate nonprofit? What, what's going on? They're going to have these, these questions. Okay. And then the next question is, well, how much do you need? How much money do you need from me? And then we get into risk, you know, um, trust and so forth. And then when do you need to buy? And, you know, you have to explain a little bit more about that. You can just say, we need to hit our goal by the end of June. There has to be a reason why, you know, if we hit our goal by this date, then we'll be able to take advantage of the generous match that are, um, you know, large, um, just, you know, life to, lifelong members have, have, have contributed. Okay. Uh, so, so talk about the money. Let me give you a little bit more details about this. So the funding gap, basically this is the amount of money needed that you don't have. And there are a number of ways to talk about the funding gap. Uh, one is really to, talk, to look at uh, stages. So our goal, $880,000. And obviously, you know, the story is this is what that's going to achieve. Okay. We have certain expenses in our organization and we're covering all that through grants and all the stuff. But in order to do these programs or do this specific program, we need to get these many people donating this much money. Okay. That's essentially what a funding gap or how to describe a funding gap. Uh, here's another one from Charity Water. Now, Charity Water is a little bit unique, but I love how they um, essentially it's positioning the funding gap. OK, and what they say down in the second paragraph, we depend on private donors, foundations and sponsors to cover everything from staff salaries to basic office systems to office rent and supplies. Right. So all that stuff is care covered by a lot of other people and organizations. And these people are really great. Uh, and their uh, investment fuels are long term mission. So the long term mission of sustainability is great. Uh, and then this allows us to use 100% of your donations of your money goes to the project, because that's another big question that people ask when they donate money. You know, they are going to ask, especially if we get into dollar size, the larger the donation, the more likely someone's going to ask, well, how much money is actually going to the result that I am standing behind that I want to be part of, right? How much money is actually going to creating clean water? Well, 100%. Don't worry about it. It's 100%. So that's how they're explaining, uh, you know, describing the fund, uh, the funding gap in this situation. And I think most organizations could, you know, say the same thing. You know, you could say, especially if you're getting, uh, you know, revenue from multiple sources, grants, large donors, sponsors, and so forth. So, you know, if they're covering the basic supplies, then you can, and that is actually true. And you're raising money to achieve specific projects. That's why, you know, when you do fundraising, uh, it's much more effective to focus on a project or a specific outcome. Okay. You know, 50 wells, you know, this is our goal, 50 wells by X date. Okay. So we're always talking in terms of the outcome, not um, how much money we need. So don't, you know, talk about the money and be really, transparent about it. Um, but when you um, talk about outcomes, you have to realize people ultimately want to have an effect in the outcome. They want to be part of the ultimate solution. Okay. Uh, here's another example right here, just to describe um, kind of the cause and effect, I guess you could say, I give you money. What is that going to create? Okay. And I love how I think I believe this is donors to, no, it's not donors to somebody else. I'm not sure, but um, I love how this is li uh, lined up, you know, futures, programs, experiences, supplies, basics. This might be donors choose. I'm not sure, but they, I, I don't think so. Um, and, but I really like how they're talking about it. Okay, great. Here's my budget, right? Here's my budget experiences, 500 to a thousand supplies, you know, you could choose. And then we see the scale. You know, where are they at right now? This is where we are at right now. And this is where we need to be. Okay. And automatically I will give a thousand dollars donate now. Okay. So that really connects the dots between the person taking out their wallet and the end result. That's that you really need to make that super clear. Don't complicate things. I love how charity water uh, has their messaging and I'll get to that in just a little bit. Um, uh, also tell them what their money does. So this is kind of what I'm saying. Uh, you know, tell people what is what you're going to do with this money. This is from donors choose. And I, this is just a great example of, uh, you know, one of the more successful uh, 
fundraisers on Donors Choose, and, and the, exactly what is going to be purchased is spelled out, right? They will design an underwater robot using PCB, uh, I'm sorry, PVC pipe and parts. Its design will allow it to compete in an under, underwater task and obstacle course based on theory learned in class, okay? So this is really, really super specific, all right? And uh, number seven, last tip here, is invite people to become part of the story. So that is the very end of the story. And uh, again, donors, uh, I'm sorry, Charity Water really connects the dots very clearly between the cause, my wallet coming out of my pocket, and the effect, okay? In fact, this sentence is so beautiful in that way. It says, donate and help girls around the world get clean water to drink, okay? Very simple. We have a picture kind of supporting the whole idea. And then they say 100% of every dollar you donate will fund clean water projects. Okay, so you're having a direct impact on the end result. And, and ultimately donors, I'm sure you guys would agree, donors really want to be part of the solution. That's the reason why they're engaging with your organization to begin with. They see you as a partner, not necessarily uh, an authority that they have to go through for that change, but they see you as a peer or a partner hopefully an equal member of the, of the community, All right? So now I'm gonna open it up for Q&A, and let me just exit out of here.